process. For, for whatever reason, I couldn't get the, um, maybe my bandwidth, I don't, or my computer, I couldn't get the videos to embed in the presentation. Um, there was a lot of lag. So I'll just give you the link um, to all the videos um, at the end, um, or I'll just, there you go. So there's the link to that, the video. I put it in the chat if you want to copy that link later. Um, so then now what I'm going to do is I'll go ahead and share my screen. And we'll start talking about these amazing creatures here. So. Okay. So just want to make sure, Suzanne, you see the, um, you see just the picture, correct? Correct. Okay. Okay, so I am using two monitors, so I might occasionally be looking away. Um, if you want, there's different ways that you can show your screen. You can show speaker view, which will basically just put me in the corner of the screen, um, or there's different choices of, of, of ways to, to view it. But so this is, this is the, the guy that I work with. This is called a Northern Sawwood Owl. Um, I, don't, uh, I didn't take this picture. I wish I would have. Uh, but uh, pretty amazing, amazing picture, amazing creature. Um, quite common. There are quite common owl. There, there are quite a few out there, but it's rarely seen. So very elusive. It's a small little owl. Um, you'll see in comparison to my size of my hand a little bit later. But it is considered the most plentiful owl in North America. Now, at one time, uh, they were so rarely seen that they were actually um, considered to be put on the endangered species list. But now with all the study, and my program is one of the programs that does the study, um, called Project OwlNet, we're part of that. Um, we've actually seen that they, they're quite common. And so that's why it's important to actually study these animals. Now, famous owl, you might have seen the Rockefeller owl. Um, after this happened, this, this poor little guy got stuck in the uh, tree um, of a Christmas tree, and they brought him in the, into New York City. And I'm not sure if you, any of you guys saw the, the, um, the news <laughs> report of this guy. When, after this happened, a lot of my friends, I probably got eight, 10 emails and text messages. Have you seen the owl? Is that your owl? Is that the owl you work with? So, yep, that's the owl I work with. I, I'm pretty partial, but I, I really think, I mean, look at that picture. They've got to be the cutest owl um, out there. They are amazing little creatures. So uh, this is their range. So if you look at the purple, um, that is the year round range. So they are year round up in the snow, up in the Northern, um, uh, in, in North America, in the Southern part of Canada, in the boreal regions of Canada. They come down um, and they're considered year round in Plumas County and um, and uh, then non-breeding and scarce. Um, let's see here. Uh, watch the, we'll see if you can show this little video clip. Watch carefully here. Can you see this? Did you see the blink? Did it show, Suzanne? I, no? I hear a little sound. Oh, but you didn't see the video? Okay. They did, yeah. I didn't, I okay. guess I was looking away. I, you looked away. Okay, I'm you so looked sorry. away. But no, it's okay. saw it and Peggy saw it, so thank you. Good. So uh, most, as I mentioned, most frequently studied and banded owl in North America. Um, their average age of encounter uh, that we capture and band these owls is 1.9 years. Um, longevity year record for these owls is 10 years and four months. So uh, 10 years or nine years, or I'm not exactly sure how old the first the owl was when it was first captured, but um, 10 years after or nine years after it was first captured, it was captured again. Um, breeze in the northern forest in the Cascades, somewhere around 4,300 feet to 7,500 feet. Here's a northern sawwood owl nest. Um, I have been doing nest box studies, um, looking to see uh, where they are nesting. I do have a couple in the Plumas National Forest nest boxes, but um, I have most of my nest boxes down in Big Chico Creek Ecological Reserve. And you can see some of the food 
um, that they have cached and stored away. Wow. Um, the male sings um, early winter to spring, um, and then the female will choose the nest, uh, the nest box or the cavity. Um, they're typically monogamous, but not always. Um, they've been known to double or even triple clutch, where one owl will have uh, a partner maybe down at lower elevation, and then um, later in the spring, uh, we'll move up to higher elevation and have another um, nest, another clutch of eggs. Um, and it's been recorded uh, a triple, three. So maybe in May, um, July, and then late August. Um, average uh, brood size is about five to six eggs. And the incubation is about a month. And then fledging uh, is about another month after they leave the nest about a month after that. So about two months and um, they're free here. So um, these owls show, exhibit what's called reverse dimorphism, die to morph shape. Um, you know, humans, we have uh, dimorphism like the males show males, sex characteristics, females, um, generally males are larger in humans and females are a little bit smaller. Um, it's different for these owls. The females are actually larger. They're slightly larger, 25% or more larger wow. than, um, than the uh, males. And so you can see some of the, the table here, the length and size. A um, couple diff different owls here. This is a big female here that I'm, um, that I think Dawn is holding that. Um, their diet cycle fluctuates, they're opportunists. So they eat what they can find. Um, some years there'll be a lot of voles and you can see in that picture in the center, there is a vole and that's one of their favorite food sources. That vole is about 50 grams. Now a male sawwood owl weighs 70 grams. Wow. So they're taking, they're taking prey almost their entire size. I mean, that's, you know, I guess you could do the math. You can see their claws there, they're pretty fierce. Um, they grab hold of that prey and their claws actually not just grab on, but they'll actually overlap and pass through. So um, they don't let go and they won't let go. Uh, their diet, as I was mentioning, follows a four year cycle of boom and bust. So uh, rodents tend to do that depending on the food source, whether it be seeds from, from conifers or grass seeds or whatever. And they follow that fluctuation um, of food. So different calls here. We've got male calls and I'll play a couple of these calls and we'll turn my volume up here. So this is a male territorial call. So the male will be on the territory, maybe has a nest cavity already picked out and saying, hey, baby, come on over here. I got a nice little spot for you. Now, we also have chirps and barks. And whales. And now their name, where does the saw wet name come from? Well, there's several theories. One of the theories it comes from a wet saw blade, the sharpening. I don't hear that I've sharpened saw blades before the grinding, I don't hear that. Another name, another theory is it comes from the skew call um, uh, of that wet saw, saw blade. And then there's another theory that uh, saw wet sounds some um, like a French term. Um, but we really don't know exactly where these, uh, where the name comes from, Sawit. So my program, and what I do is, the main program is a fall monitoring program. So in the fall, what I'll do is I'll set up the nets and we'll, we'll study and we'll try to capture them. So 
Uh, I'm part of Project Owlnet, and uh, these are some of the different stations around the country. And you can see there's a lot of coverage on the East Coast, um, a lot less in the West Coast. So we're trying to get some more people um, uh, licensed to band. Uh, I just sub-permitted um, a colleague of mine, Erica, in uh, Shasta County, and she's opening up. Uh, we're going to have her open up maybe a fall station next year. Um, another colleague of mine uh, opened up, Macy opened up, uh, Macy Hatch. I don't know if some of you might know her. She spent some time up in Plumas um, working with the Raptors. Um, she opened up a, in a Humboldt County. Um, so uh, over 140 stations. Um, we have uh, kind of unified protocol as far as netting, capturing, how we measure them. Um, and there's kind of a unified protocol that we all follow, um, which makes our data, uh, you know, much more valuable when the, the protocol is, is pretty much the same. Um, <clears throat> where do these guys come from? Well, they do fly all over. Now, um, it kind of would look like at this map, there's a West Coast population and maybe an East Coast population. Well, they've done some mitochondrial DNA studies on these owls. And they found that there's no significant difference between the East Coast population and the West Coast population. So what that says is because there's no significant DNA um, difference, there's mixing. Some of those East Coast owls are coming to the central part of, of uh, the United States and the central owls are going to the, to the West and the West are going to the central. And so there's mixing throughout North America. Um, and that's why we have that kind of that uniform uh, DNA. Now, where do I do my study? Well, I do my study at the Big Chico Creek Ecological Reserve. So this is just down from, from Forest Ranch. So if you were to look, um, I don't know if, uh, can you see my mouse pointing here? Is the uh, pointer working? No? I'm looking. Okay. okay. Is there an well, owl look, there? Uh, no, I was just oh. pointing with my mouse. Um, <laughs> if you look uh, on the right-hand side, that would be Forest Ranch, kind of in the, in, the, in the canyon here. Well, this canyon is Big Chico Creek, and just upstream of, of this canyon is uh, Mount Lassen. Uh, Mount Lassen. So if you were, and you know, you even might be able to see it down right as those, the canyon comes, I can kind of see there's a little bit, um, a little bit of white there. Um, so it all, this canyon is a pretty productive site, and it acts like a funnel. So all these owls that are migrating, coming from the north, moving south, um, kind of get funneled to our station. So uh, why do we study? Well, we want to learn more about these guys. We still, there's so much we don't know. I was answering an email from someone that I was asking questions about, well, where are they breeding? We still don't know where our West Coast owls breed. Where are they? We don't know for sure. We know that they breed up in, in Plumas County. Because if any of you have been up there in maybe April, May, you might have heard that that broadcast of the male. Um, and if the male is broadcasting, then he probably has a site um, and he's trying to lure a female in. So uh, this is our station. We can see Highway 32 here, Owl uh, 3, 2, and 4 here. Uh, most of my research is done at uh, Station 3. Owl 3 is just below the barn, if you've ever been to Big Chico Creek Ecological Reserve. Um, now, our net array, we put up four nets. And what, what we want to do is we want to capture these owls, but for a very brief time, we want to capture them so we can weigh them, we can measure them, we can see if they're healthy, we can pull off some of the if they had parasites, we can clear the parasites off them. And what we do is we play a uh, audio lure. So it is that, that, that call, and we'll play it for four hours straight. Um, there are some pauses and different calls mixed in with that. Um, so we'll play it for several hours straight, and uh, they get lured into those nets. And I just see that there's a couple chat questions. The French word, yeah. Um, for whatever reason, my chat isn't showing. Yeah, he has an interesting comment. I don't know how you pronounce the French word. So it's yeah, the French word, Charlotte. Uh, species. 
Yeah, Charlotte, as in saw it, maybe. Um, yeah, you, my pointer is not working. Did you want me to read the whole? Co it would be. Um, it would be Shuet. Shuet. Yeah. Shuet. Yeah, Shuet. Shuet. They said the French were the first Europeans to encounter this species in what is now Eastern Canada. Right. And when the name became anglicized, perhaps it became Solway. That's the comment. I don't think there's any other questions though. I've been looking. Okay. So what I'm gonna do is there, I put a video link and I'll put the link for the video at the end. So as I mentioned, I can't uh, embed the videos in. So we'll, we'll just go ahead and talk about um, the process of, of how we process these owls. So looking at this picture here, we can see um, there's a colleague of mine, Wyatt there. He is sub-permitted um, to work under me and uh, I've got one of these sawits in my hand. It looks like I'm uh, maybe looking at the band or about to put a band on their leg. So that's the first thing we do. Once we capture these owls, we bring them up to this station. Um, we put a band on their leg and that's a unique band. Um, no other number, you know, it's unique. So if you were to find one of these bands, you could turn it in and um, uh, get information about that owl. I'll we'll talk more about that later. So we put a band on their leg. And I think this is a video and actually I wanna skip this video so we don't have a problem. Okay. Okay, good. Okay, so um, we put a band on their leg and you can see the male on the right-hand side, the female on the left, the females are larger. And then on the female on the left, you can see the band on her leg. Um, they've made a new band actually for this owl. It's the perfect size for the females and the males. It's called a size four um, short. It's a kind of a shorter because they have the short tarsus um, that it's a shorter, shorter band that fits them better. Now, some of the data that we collect, well, we've got the band number. If you look at this data sheet, um, the age, sex, the wing cord, and the wing cord is a measurement of uh, basically from the wrist to the fingertips, okay? Um, tail length, tail bars, nares to tip. We haven't been doing that, but that's like the, the nares right here on the, on the owl to the tip of the bill. Um, the mass, bander, net, tier, time, and date. Okay, so first thing and probably one of the most important things that we want to, to get is uh, the sex. Is it a male or is it a female? And there are two measurements to, that we use to determine the sex. Now the females are larger than the males, but there's two measurements. One of these measurements is this, uh, the wing cord. And that is, even though uh, it looks like that would be a shoulder, that's actually the wrist where the top of that gauge is. So we measure that length of the, from the wrist to the wings, to the tips of the wings. And we also use mass, um, a um, mass, we weigh it. So um, what we've got here, and what we do is we take those two numbers and we, there's a little chart that we plot it. And we can actually figure out that, well, if it is a, the wing is 120, 133, and the weight is greater than 89, it's a female. Or um, 125, less than 85, it's a male. So we can basically figure out if it's a male or female by um, com comparing those two, um, two measurements. Um, was a question, do we wear gloves? No, um, I don't wear gloves because I feel I really, they're pretty fragile, um, you know, uh, and gloves are, are pretty cumbersome. Um, yeah, I do get scratched. I do get bit. I'll have lots of little scratches, almost like berry vines, you know, like if you're picking blackberries. Um, so by the end of the season, I've got lots of scratches all over my fingers, but I figured that's what I get. You know, I deserved it. So, um, and, um, yeah, yeah, we can see any owl with a mask greater than 93 or more is a female. If it's less, um, uh, it's then 78, it's a male. Yep. Yes, it definitely is worth it. Now, so now we know, it's a, is it a male or female? We can tell that by the, it looks like a shoulder, but um, kind of right below the license plate, we would put the gauge to the tip of the wing um, if, on this picture. Now, 
So we figure out if it's a male by the, the, the wing cord and the mass. Now we figure out its age by the age of the feathers. Now these guys don't molt all at once or they don't molt randomly. They actually have a very specific uh, molt and which makes it really easy. Um, screech owls, they don't molt as easily um, as for us to determine as saw wits. So if this owl was one year old, maybe it was not even a year old, if it hatched this summer, then all those feathers would be uniform. They would all be the same age and the same color. And I'll show you about age and color. But then after it, um, after the first year, so the second year birds, then what they start to do is they start to molt the, the tips. So P stands for primary. So they would molt maybe primary 10, 9, 8. And then secondary feathers, if you look at that picture here, secondary 13, maybe they'd molt 13, 12, 11, 10. So they molt on the wing tips and then closer to the body, which kind of makes sense because if they're flying, um, you know, the tips of the wings are gonna get, you know, on branches or whatever, or damaged. So they'll uh, molt uh, those wing tips and then closer to the body. So if you see a bird that has um, old feathers in the center and new feathers on the tips and near the body, then that would be a two year bird. If you see a bird that has all the same, then that would be a first year bird. And then after the two years, they molt as needed. And I'll show you lots of pictures about that. So if you're a little bit confused, well, don't worry, we'll go over. But just to, re to kind of uh, reinforce the idea, if it's all the same age, it's first year, fresh feathers on the tip and near the body, it's a second year. And then after that, um, it's after second um, ASY. Sometimes we can get a third year but they just kind of randomly molt after that. Okay, so looking at this picture here, you can see this is a pretty uniform bird, okay? All the feathers are kind of the same. So I would call this a second or first year or a hatch year. They're all fresh, all fresh, a hatch year bird. Now we have a special magic trick. Well, it's not magic, but we use a UV light and the UV light illuminates a chemical in their wings called porphyrin. So if there's ever a tough bird, it's like, oh, I can't really tell, you know, looking at this one, is that an old feather or a young feather? It's really hard to tell sometimes. So if you hold a UV light up to under the underside of the wing, um, they illuminate and they, they glow. And you'll definitely see when we see an older. So this is a hatch year because they're all uniform and the same. If you look at that little spot on the chest there, maybe it did um, it did molt uh, a few feathers on, on the belly there also, okay? So this confirms, if we're ever not sure, we put a UV light and it'll confirm, oh, that's a hatch year bird. Now, a second year bird or SY, remember fresh on the tips, fresh near the body, but old. Do you see the difference where there's that bar with the O? They're a little bit uh, more uh, faded, um, a little bit less dark. Um, so those are older feathers. So they're fresher on the tips, fresher in the body. Oh, that's a second year bird. Now, when we put the UV light, look at that. So you can see how different that is. So uh, it's pretty unmistakable, right? You can see, look at that. Oh, those are fresh feathers on the tip. Those feathers are not even a year old. We got old feathers in the body, in the center, okay? So that's how we see if it's a second year bird. Now, after that, it's not quite as easy. Um, they replace as needed. If you're looking at this, we've got fresh in the center. That's what the F is, old near the body. And VO is very old. So there's three generations of feathers here. So this bird could be three years old, but the bird could be 10 years old too. Um, we know that it's more than three. After three, we don't know, unless it's been recaptured. And this is what it looks like with this one. You can see we got fresh and old and they're intermixed. Some are really faded. You can see how the dots on the underside of the wings, that forefront kind of comes up on some and not on others. 
So this would be a after, we would call this an ASY after second year. Because we, we don't want to call it a third year at TY because it could be a fourth year, a fifth year, a sixth year. We don't know. So just to be safe, we call it an ASY. Okay. So um, now we know that it's a it's sex, male or female, by the wing cord and the mass. We know that it's age by the molt pattern and how the feathers molt. Um, so that's the main data that we collect. Now, um, some of our uh, results that we got this season. So if we look at the season and we look at the graph here, uh, 2020, this is the last season, we had a pretty decent year. But if we look at the number of days that we went out, um, we had really good weather. So we went out um, a lot more. So even though it looks like we, did, we had a good year, when we compare our numbers, um, we compare the numbers by the net hours, by how many owls we ca catch per hours the net is open. We see that um, it wasn't that really great, uh, but it was a pretty good year. So next year, we're looking for it to be another one of these big bumper years. And it, you know, we just got over 110 owls um, this year, um, last year. We had around 100, um, and then the year before, 120 something, and the year before, over 160. So next year, we're looking for a bumper year. Now, we look at the how it's dispersed. Right now, um, hatch year, look at uh, 2017. Look at that hatch year. That was one of these bumper years. You can look at, we got over 120 hatch year birds. We got more hatch year birds, birds that hatched in the summer, um, then we got all of last year combined. So what that tells us is that is one of these bumper years where there was a lot of food, a lot of successful nesting. And then this year, look at the, our, our hatch year uh, 2020. If you look at that number on the bottom um, right, there's less, right? So we look at our hatch years, we only had 47 this year um, and 62 um, after, 62 of the older birds, and uh, 47 of the younger birds. So that gives us information about the food, okay? Um, and the low numbers in 2013 and 2014, um, that was the year, uh, 2014 was the year that there was an accident up at the reserve and the deck fell. Um, some of you may have been in um, uh, part of Audubon at the time, there was a function for all the Northern California and they were taking a picture on the deck and the deck fell and some people actually got really hurt. Uh, they were airlifted. Yeah. Um, mm, so wow. they closed, they closed it. Uh, we couldn't drive in and we were only out just a few nights and we actually had to walk in. So we had to open up another station. So, um, 2017 is the year that I took over as the director. So, um, when I took it over, I started doing about six nights per week. Um, so more monitoring. And uh, so we're going to continue that data. Up. Okay, so uh, one of the things that we looked at to see if there's a pattern of full moon. Um, partial, you know, you can kind of see that there's a pattern in full moon. There's less capture. Um, in new moon, there's more capture. And it's interesting that there's a little delay. Um, with the new moon and, and with a full moon as far as, um, you know, the moon comes up over the mountain and uh, if there's a full moon, the nets are more visible. Um, so that's some new data that we're just kind of um, looking at and would like to collect um, for future. Uh, influenced by fires. Yeah, you know, in, if we look back here, 2018 was a year with a campfire and I had to close the, the fire came right up to the reserve boundary. So Highway 32 was the line that the fire stopped. So there were full scorched leaves in the reserve. Um, there was a lot of ash in the reserve that fell. Um, so the reserve didn't burn, but it, it was the line where it stopped. So um, I, was, I had to stop um, the monitoring there. It would be interesting to see. Um, <clears throat> You know, when we look back here, we can see, well, it's about the same number of hatch year um, um, as, you know, 2018 and tw or 2019 and 2020. 
Okay, so this is the number that's kind of important to us here. This number here, which is the owls captured in net hours. So in 2017, that, <clears throat> that number 26.1, if you look to the left of the arrow, 26.1, that says it's a really good year, right? Mm -hmm. There's 26 owls. And then last year was only what, 16.0. So that tells us more. Even though we caught a lot of owls, that tells us um, how successful we were. So we caught a lot more, a, a good amount of owls, but we were out a lot more nights because it wasn't raining and the weather was good. Now, why do we do this? What's our big prize? Well, our big prize is to capture an owl that has already been banded or to have someone capture one of our owls. It's pretty rare. It doesn't happen very much. And when we do, I am jumping up and down. I'm excited when we get a foreign recovery, that's called a foreign recovery. Now we've had three foreign recoveries. We, we have recovered three owls from different banding stations. Um, our first one was in Montana. So you can see the red arrow in Montana. That was banded in, um, uh, 2011, in 2011, we caught that owl. I'm looking here at the data um, at the owl research in the Bitterroot Valley. And 40 days later, that owl flew to our station. So these owls are transient. They're moving all over. They don't follow these north-south patterns like our snow geese do. So they're moving to where there's food. They're moving, um, you know, is there more food in one, is more pressure in another, maybe a fire they're moving in or moving out. So that Montana owl came to us less than 40 days. Um, the Iowa, you can see that second one, the Iowa, um, that was Hitchcock Nature Center. That was banded in 2013. And that came to us a full year later. So that owl maybe went north, came to us in the fall. But prior, the prior fall, it was banded with them. And then maybe after it, it spent some time in Iowa, maybe went a little bit farther south. And then up in the summer, in the summer, it went up into Canada and then came down to us. And then the white arrow on the left, that was our last one. That one was banded in Cobble Hill, British Columbia. And that was in 2018. So we've captured three and that's, that's it. And that owl was uh, two years old. So two years, um, maybe going up and back, but it took two years to finally come to our station. Now our station, we've banded over a thousand, 1100 owls um, since 20, um, yeah, 2005. Um, so um, 2005, we banded over two, uh, 1,200 owls. So only three, that's not very much. Now we've only had one owl, just one. One of our owls get banded, uh, get captured, that we banded, was captured at another station. And Julie Newman, I don't know if she's in. I don't know. I didn't see her name. Is she in? I didn't see her here. No, tonight. Oh. But we all we know her from our Pumas Audubon. Yeah, I should have I should have sent her uh, an email to remind her. But hi, Julie I'm Newman. here. I'm anonymous. Oh, oh good. Yes, oh, we love Julie. Voice. <laughs> oh, good. We love Julie. Well, Julie Newman banded that owl, so I'm so excited that she banded this owl, and um, and I believe Julie, you might have to correct me. You were up at Rocky Point, just below that arrow, um, and you worked in the fall. And then when you came back that same year, you banded an owl, and then it went back up to them. I think, is that the timeline? Is it in the same year that you were at Rocky Point, 2018? Yes, I'm thinking yeah. that is correct. Yeah, so she sent an owl. So she spent some time in, in British Columbia working with these owls. She banded one with us, a month later after she left and she pushed it back. And then the following year, they got it up in British Columbia. So <laughs> that was pretty, pretty thrilling for us that they got one of our owls. And Julie, way, way to go, Julie. Uh, she banded that owl and sent it back, sent it back up there. So yeah, and I didn't know if Julie was in, she's been working with me um, for the, um, that four or the five seasons that I've been the director. Um, hand in hand. Uh, she was working with Don, the previous director, um, for years before. Um, and uh, she's banned. And I don't, I don't remember the number, but 
lots of owls, very experienced, lots of owls. So, and if you ever capture an owl or not capture an owl or find a bird with a band and you send it into the USGS bird banding laboratory, they send you this neat little certificate. So this little certificate says that um, the bird that we captured was banded by Andrew Stewart and it was banded in 2017 and we captured it in 2018 or 2019. And um, you can get information. I looked up Andrew um, and have another colleague. I looked him up and he said, oh yeah, this bird was this sex and it was this um, weight and you know shared more information. So that's why it's really important to have um, uh, feather, you know, this project element because we can all communicate with our other co colleagues. Yeah, there are just a few stations. So I'm hoping to get more stations. Maybe Julie can open one up in Plumas County for at least a couple nights. Um, but it'd be nice to do some, uh, put some nest boxes up there and maybe even some, uh, some breeding study up in that way. So speaking of nest boxes, I put up 20 nest boxes up in uh, Big Chico Creek Ecological Reserve because I was trying to find out where these owls were actually, um, where are they coming from? We, we really don't know. We really don't know where our owls are coming from, not 100%. We know we have some ideas with the three that we've captured and the one that maybe there is some movement on the West Coast, but we don't know for sure. And um, the reserve is down around 1900 feet in elevation. So I think it's a little bit low for sawwits, but we did get a screech owl in the same nest box four years in a row. We've had the same mama have babies. Now we know it's the same mama because she has, has a band. I put a band on her leg. Um, so she has produced over 12 screech owls out of that same nest box. And um, I've placed them, I've placed five other boxes looking for sawwits up in Plumas National Forest um, and um, uh, some in paradise in different places. Um, so here you can see there's the mama. Her head is kind of pointing up so the back of her head is at the bottom and you can see one of her little babies here. And that's this year. There wasn't a lot of, yeah, this is a picture from this year. There was not very much uh, rodents. The rodents weren't there. So I look at what they were, what was in the box and mostly was in the box was feathers, probably spotted tilly feathers. And that the owls were actually pulling the birds out of when you know the birds were roosting, the owls were hunting. Um, that's what they resorted to, and you know they were pretty successful because they got three um, three outlets out of that um, out of that nest box. So they were able to produce three. So they were getting enough of them. So uh, this next picture, oh, you uh, you can see um, that's that's at the age where I put a band on their leg, and you can see the screech owl um, in the center picture. And these screech owls are bigger. Um, they're bigger. Um, at this age, um, about a month, about this age, a month after they hatch, they're old enough that we can put a band on their leg, that their tarsus is fully developed, and they're, um, they're, that, that bone is done growing. They might uh, gain some weight, or actually they tend to lose some weight. Um, the mamas get them good and fat before she lets them fledge. Um, Porphyrin, uh, what does it do? It's not for strength. It's just um, probably, you know, we're starting to learn that some animals actually can see ultraviolet. Um, so there might be something to do with that. Uh, I haven't heard or read a study about, the question was, uh, what does porphyrin do in the feathers? Is it for strength? Um, no, it's, it's a chemical like a color. It's a color. Um, and uh, you know, maybe it helps them communicate age. I, I, I'm not sure. So not only do we get owls, we get northern flying or actually Humboldt's flying squirrel. So this is a flying squirrel in one of my nest boxes. What I did is I have, there's a, a GoPro camera on that pole and I stuck the camera in the nest box hole and out popped this flying squirrel. So the flying squirrel was nesting in there and you can see the little flap of skin there. Um, from the from the limb, and uh, I was pretty excited. I put the camera on the back side of the tree. So if you follow the the pole down, you can see my hand, and I'm on the opposite side, so I can't see this, but I'm able to take a picture by reaching around and taking a picture with my phone. 
Um, so we've got the, here's a baby northern fly, flying squirrel we've pulled out, um, pretty young guy. And then um, you can see there's another one. Um, these guys, the, it's just bycatch. We're, we're not trying to catch the humble flying squirrel. Um, we tend to get a couple a year. This year, we didn't get any. Um, you know, maybe every other year, more like every other year, we'll get one. Um, or maybe every second or third year. But we didn't get one this year, but we did get one last year. And uh, I do, if you can see, I'm wearing gloves for these, for the mammals. So the flying squirrels, they, they bite hard. Um, I am wearing gloves for this guy. And uh, in this little video, I think this video does show, um, it could be, uh, yeah, watch this video here, you can see. You can see the flaps of skin. You can see the collar. He's not too tangled and I kind of open it up. Like kind of like a cat's cradle. Now watch this. So they can't really run. They can't really run because their skin's attached, so they kind of hop. And um, so pretty neat, pretty fun to, to capture something like that. Um, so in my nest boxes, there's a flying squirrel nest. That's what that nest looked like. You can see a lot of lichens in there, some grasses. Um, uh, we get ash-throated fly catchers nest in our um, nest boxes, and then a lot of the animal hair, deer hair, that's one of the th nesting materials that they use. We also get uh, bats. Um, this is called a pallid bat and pallid means pale. And um, so its chest has kind of a pale color. Um, these guys, you know, when I'm working with the mammals, as I mentioned, I'm wearing gloves. Um, this is one of their favorite food for sources. These um, Jerusalem crickets, um, I have uh, one of my uh, assistants, a uh, college student, um, uh, is a Hispanic young woman. And she was saying that they call them um, children of the earth, uh, tierra, uh, niños de tierra, something like that. Um, and they kind of look like a baby, those Jerusalem crickets. If you kind of look, it's not the back part, but the face anyway. Um, but those owls love these crickets. So what they'll do is they'll be looking for the crickets down close to the ground and fly into the net. And when they're that close to the ground, they turn off their sonar. Um, and that's probably one of the other reasons that we will sometimes capture um, bats. This year, I only caught one bat and we don't wanna catch bats. Bats, not, it's not fun because they do get tangled, they do bite. Um, and I was able to just open the net like I did before and he flew right out. So that was optimum. Um, screech owl, yeah, it's, yeah, screech owls in the neighborhood, owl box, flying squirrel and Quincy, yeah, it's pretty neat to see these flying squirrels. Now watch the video here. So you can see the, uh, the bat climb. Now bats do not have the ability to take off from the ground. Their wings, right, they would hit the ground. So what they have to do, bats have to climb up a tree and then leap and then glide and then they can flap. So we put him near the tree, he climbed up and then flew off. So uh, we didn't capture one of these guys, but uh, ringtail cat, we were out um, waiting. Um, now our protocol, I didn't really talk about that, but we're out for four hours. Um, and while we're out for four hours, four hours calling, um, every 30 minutes, we go and check the nets. If there's owls, we bring them in. But there's a lot of time that's wasting. If it's kind of a slow night, we're just waiting um, for the next net run. And we heard some scurrying. Um, and there were some turkeys that were roosting in the tree. And this uh, ringtail cat was kind of going after them. Um, so, and this is just a picture I took with my iPhone. And this little video, you can see it kind of scurrying up the tree there. Wow. So that was kind of a fun thing. So um, 
this uh, one of uh, one of the college students. Um, I do uh, need volunteers every year. Um, I know Julie comes down. She comes down for three or four days in a row and she'll volunteer and help me out. Um, but uh, I do need volunteers. Look at the, the, the difference in these owls from, if you remember one of the first pictures of that one female was fierce and fiery. She wanted to fight. Um, and then this one down in the center looks just kind of baked, just kind of a little, you know, kind of a goofy cross-eyed. Um, and then another one looks kind of noble, the one on the left, but um, <laughs> I don't know if you can see, she's petting it. She's like, oh, buddy. <laughs> he's completely liking that scratching. He's going <laughs> so sometimes if they're pretty agitated by just scratching it by just petting it a little bit does calm them down a little bit um, i've seen plenty of videos that people have shared with me uh, of owls that are pets which i don't like that you know that that would be someone's pet but um they do they do like to be to be scratched to be groomed or um okay so let's look at some of my volunteers there's Julie. There we go. Julie on the far right there um, with an owl. Don Garcia with the yellow um, headlight on the bottom left. She's uh, started the station in 2005. And um, a couple more of my assistants. Erica um, down the bottom um, with the gray hat. She is opening up the station up in Shasta County. And then White is my other subcommittee. Um, uh, has been working with uh, with me for a couple of years too. So um, I'm coming to the end here. But if there, if you want to participate, if you want to um, make a donation or participate in the study and volunteer, you can look me up. Um, I uh, my email address is in on the Altacal website, or Suzanne would share it with you, or someone else might be able to share it. Um, I'll I'll share it. Um, but if you want to, to volunteer, I do need volunteers. And um, if you want to click that donate button, and we're in the process of reworking our website, so forgive it. It's really, there's lots of errors. So we've got another website, we've got someone working on it. But um, this is my goal. I'd love to get these little sawwet babies. Um, I haven't had any baby sawwets um, in any of my nest boxes. So hopefully some of my uh, Plumas National Forest um, boxes will produce some babies. And uh, so there's my email address. So if you have any other questions, you're welcome to send me an email down the bottom right. And uh, you can find us at altacal.org. So are there any questions? You already have a couple lined up in the chat there, um, Ken. Let me see. Okay, so let me end the show here. Let me see where they were. I just, uh... Yeah, when you ended the show, I lost my chat. <laughs> okay, so um, Plumas for hosting us, yeah. It's one of them is, do owls carry any significant diseases like our siskins currently do? That they do have cool. they do have parasites. So they have this nasty look fly. It's about the size of a house fly. It's called a um, hippoboscus fly, H fly. And they're like a house fly in size, but they're flat. Um, and they're blood sucking. So, um, you, you know, you, you find them, sometimes they'll go down your sleeves. They don't suck on humans, um, but you do take them home. And I've taken them home and, um, you know, maybe got a drink of water or whatever, and then see them crawling across the floor in the kitchen, like, oh! Um, so we try to get rid of those, uh, those, uh, those parasites. Um, uh, I have not heard of other diseases, but a lot of these diseases, um, there's some rhinitis disease, there's other diseases that they can um, get, but uh, I've not been warned or have not seen anything to watch for in with my colleagues of other owl banders. Another question was, um, the you, you mentioned that USGS has the banding program or that would be who would send you the certificate anyway the person's wondering yep. why them instead of the united states forest what fish and wildlife service that was the yeah that's that's a great question and and i've i've asked and thought that same thing um but they've been doing it for years um for whatever reason usts uh 
they have the bands. When I need new bands, I send them an email and they send me bands um, to be licensed. I had to send a proposal to them. So I'm not sure why it started with USGS. Um, so I guess not just geology, it's uh, plants too, or animals, sorry. So that's what GS is, Geological Service? Society, yeah, yeah. Okay. And they have the data, right, of all, is that who has yes. the data of all this yeah. banding? Yeah. Maybe yeah. they just had a bigger computer or something. I, I know that sounds crazy, but you never know. Yeah. They've yeah. been having it for a long time. Oh, there's another question, isn't there? Uh, how would you characterize the difference between the saw wet and the pygmy owl call? Oh, yeah, good. They're, they're a lot of the same tone. It's a pygmies, there's tended to be about a one to two second space between the next and saw wets are very rapid. And um, so, but similar in tone, you know. And uh, when we're out and we hear that that tone, it's a little bit different than it's almost like a recorder, um, you know, like the little flute thing, um, that tone, that repeating tone. But that with uh, pygmies, there's a little the space, uh, about a second and a half. But they both repeat, do they, Ken? You know what I mean? Yeah. Over and over yeah. and over. Yep. And then screech owls. I, there's a screech owl in my neighborhood. Um, screech owls are like a bouncing ball. Like, boop, 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 You know, it's, I can hear them sometimes through the window or if I'm out on my, my jacuzzi or whatever at night and I can hear those in the neighborhood. Those are always fun. Does the male and female song differ? Yeah. Um, if you remember at the presentation, the male is that repeating, um, the female are the screeches and the ewes and the, um, um, there's like there's like a Twitter almost. I think they have like 12 different calls, but the, the females do not make that repeating uh, sound. Does your station participate in uh, maps? Um, no, we haven't uh, directly worked with the maps. Um, we have done some uh, sampling with, uh, I see something about DNA. We have taken feather samples. And um, my first year that I started in 2017 uh, as a director, we took feather samples and we sent them in. And um, I've just was in contact with the PH student, PhD student, and he's in the middle of processing uh, the, the feathers and he's looking for isotope studies. So what he was doing is looking for where, and this is the information I can't wait to get because these isotope studies on these feathers, we took feathers that were one year, two years and three year feathers. These isotope studies will tell us on the, the feathers that are three years old, where was that owl drinking water basically? So it's looking for the hydrogen ions, the hydrogen isotopes. It, it'll tell us where it was drinking water because every region has a different uh, makeup. So we can, we will actually be able to, uh, with his information, be able to see, okay, it's first year, it was in New York, the next year in Iowa, and then the final year, it's, it was in California or you know something like that. So it's pretty amazing to think that these isotope studies can actually figure out by you know, where that animal was. Um, their pellets, I have not studied the pellets. I know Julie, one of my colleagues who has a station up in, Ma in Napa, she did her master's thesis on um, the winter nesting and she put uh, radio trackers on them. She was looking at their pellets. Um, honestly, very, they are very hard. Sawets are very hard to find during the day, very hard. Um, I know I've got them all over the reserve, you know, on a good night, I'll ban 17 owls. And, you know, and I mentioned it's the most plentiful owl. Well, we have two screech owls on the reserve, on the 4,000 acre reserve, but 17 sawwets will come through. Um, so that's why you can see that there's more, but they're very hard to find um, to actually study their, um, their pellets. Actually, I haven't found any sawwet pellets but Julie has, and she did a study on what they were eating from those pellets. Um, 
is there a way to attract an owl, owl box? Yeah, you know what? If you go to um, Nest Watch, um, Project Nest Watch, um, Nest W A, you know, Watch, um, it's a, from Cornell. Uh, they have plans for nest boxes. They tell you where to put them, um, uh, and that's not just for owls, but for all birds. You just type in American robin. Well, they don't, you know, they don't nest in a in a box. It'll tell you that. Oh, well, they're in a basket, open. Um, but um, those birds that have like a bluebird, it'll give you plans for a bluebird, where to place it, how high, um, what way should it face, the size of the hole. Um, but Project Nest Watch through Cornell. That's a good way to, to attract. Um, any other information, male, female song? Which other owls have you been caught in your nets or flown? Close to them, yeah. Um, so we've had um, <clears throat> sawwets and screech owls regularly. Every year we'll get a couple screech owls. Um, uh, Don was doing some um, uh, monitoring of um, songbirds, passerines, and she got a pygmy owl during the day. Um, we've heard uh, spotted owls um, calling in the area and that's down around 1700 feet. So um, we have um, barn owls that fly over. So the question was what are other owls uh, are in? We have barn owls fly over and they have that awful death, you know, the barn owls have this weird screech. Yeah. Um, you know, you would think the screech owl would they'd switch, right? But barn owls have this raspy, the scraping iron screech um, and uh, great horn owls. Um, I have not had any long ears or uh, short ear owls in the area or flammulated. Um, they, they probably come through, but we've not caught any um, of those. Um, oh, Wes Dempsey's gift. Yeah, I don't know if you saw that in the news, but Wes Dempsey, um, professor, at the university, um, emeritus, um, just a great guy. Um, him and, and his wife also, uh, they donated to the reserve a million dollars. So in memory of their family and their son who passed away, he was on a bicycle and was killed on Highway 32, I believe. So uh, in memory of him and part of the family, they, so they donated a million dollars to the reserve. So that's pretty, pretty exciting. That'll, that'll keep the reserve open for a, a while. Wow. Oh, so that was the news, a recent Yeah, that was in the news. Yeah, that was recently in the news. Okay, so I was hoping because he's older, you know, and um, yeah. um, I was afraid of what yeah. you say. Yeah, he's, yeah. Um, now, there's any other questions? I, I would like to know where we would find an owl right now. Is that in lower, I mean, the sawwit, in, in lower elevations? They, and then, and then, so some of the population hangs out there and nests, and then the rest, some of them come up to the higher elevation. Is yeah, we do kind of have wintering owls, and we have studied that uh, for the Snow Goose Festival. Almost every year we'll capture one. And frequently it's one that was banded earlier in the fall. Mm -hmm. So they come through, a few stay in the reserve. Um, but these owls, the males, and if you, I don't think I shared the data, but that we tend to get um, like four females for every male, sometimes five females. So we get females a lot more often. And one of the theories of why we get more females is because the males tend to stay on territory. They maybe have a really great nest cavity. They stay on it, they protect it. So you probably have males in Plumas For National Forest right now, even in the snow, they're still hunting. So there's males up there right now. Um, the females might come up slope to breed um, in May, um, April, May, um, and then listen, listen for them. So they're there. Um, I live between Chester and Westwood near Lake Almanor, and I got a pretty excited, frantic call this summer. Um, and my girlfriend in Westwood had a picture on the phone of a of a of a fledgling sawwet owl. Oh, nice! It, yeah. So yeah. I don't. So I didn't think check the date. I didn't yeah. think to check the date, but um, 
a anyway, yeah, it's pretty exciting. So I told her, get the cat in. And she hadn't even thought of that. And she's running around getting the cat in. And, and shortly thereafter, it was gone, which I can only right. hope, you know. Yeah. That... Well, frequently, these owls will do that. And a lot of birds will do, um, what they'll do is they'll fledge early. Like those nest boxes are so cramped that they'll fledge even, they'll leave the box even before they're really good flyers. And then they will be branch hoppers that basically they'll find a branch and the mom will bring the food and the dad will bring food to them in different locations. So a lot of, you know, sometimes uh, putting a, a bird that's on the ground back in the nest isn't a good thing because it's too cramped in there. They left for a reason. So sometimes just taking a bird and finding a nice branch that's secluded um, that other predators can't get to it, um, the mom will still find them. Um, and that's usually the best thing is if you ever find a baby bird, find a branch that's, you know, maybe in the woods or that's not quite so uh, visible and the mother will still feed them. They'll come back to that spot until they get their feathers. And boy, in four days, five days, they can get, they grow flight feathers. It, it, they come in very quickly. Yeah, I, I knew that the mother would help that bird, that we just yep. needed to get him, the cat, you know, back. Yep, up. exactly. I see another, sometimes you have questions I don't have, Ken, but anyway, I see two different questions. One, what hours of the night do the males call, is a question. So, um, gosh, you know, they call during, in the afternoon, the day they're, they're crepuscular. So they, they're basically on uh, around twilight. They'll be calling just before sunset, just after sunset, and then in the morning also. So they kind of go on each side of sunrise, sunset, um, in the morning and the evening. Um, that's when they mostly do their calling. But um, very familiar with Sawan owls in Northern California. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm not sure what you mean. I think he wants to know how to what help him if find him in uh, Iowa and Nebraska. This yeah, you know, put up uh, nest boxes. We need lots of nest boxes. And if you if you have any owls or screech owls or sowets, I'd love to come up there and ban your owl for you, because um, I definitely need that. Uh, we need the data. Where are these owls coming from? So if you find, you know, one of these um, fledglings, let me know. I'll drive up the hill and put a band on it and to see if one of those owls comes to us. That would be really neat information to find out. Um, new feathers of the UV light, sure. Somebody's asking him to show another picture. I mean, show a picture again. Okay, can you see that? Can you see that feather, the picture? I can, yes, yes, we can. Yeah. I'm sorry, okay. I'm sorry. I was so busy yeah. looking, staring at it. No, it's okay. So someone uh, was looking, wanting to know. So this is a hatch year. They're all the same. Um, this is a second year, fresh on the tips, old in the center. And then this is a after second year, fresh and old. And then look at, there's a very old right there. There's not very much glowing, so. Do that. That was Lindsay. Lindsay is that what you, Lindsay? Is that what you're looking for? Lindsay, did you get your question answered? Is she muted? She's muted. Okay. There. Yes, that's what I was looking for. It's so beautiful. Thanks. Yeah, oh. sure. <laughs> and then. When do I put up the nets? So I put the nets up in the fall. So October 15th through November um, 15th or so. Um, protocol is six nights a week. I can turn off the screen share. Um, oh. Six nights a week um, for four hours. So that's when I'm out doing the main. But I also do some spring study. So in the next couple of weeks, I'll um, go out a couple of times just to see um, if some of these owls are coming back in the opposite direction. We always get a lot more owls in the fall. For whatever reason, spring, we catch much less. Hmm. So if no other questions. Well, well, I'm still trying to figure out where to see a saw wet right now. 
you you told me that I could see him in the wind. Maybe they're around here. I mean, I find it hard to believe. I'm sorry that well, you know, with all the snow. I guess I just I forgot yeah. that was the answer. Yeah, <laughs> Suzanne, just go outside and look. Like I said, they're they're hard to find. You might have to listen for them. You know, in in a few months. But um, I've actually I've never been out looking for a saw wet during the day and found one. You know, and I've been studying these guys for years. So. Sure. I, yeah, it, they're hard to find. I've I've handled 500 of them, but um, you know I've never actually found one just in you know. Sure. So other questions? Well, it's been a pleasure. Um, thanks for allowing me to come and share. And uh, if you'd like, uh, you know, more information, you can. Um, you can come up and uh, or come down and and uh, or if you want more information, you can email me. But if you uh, are interested in volunteering, um, you know, look me up. And uh, we always need uh, you know volunteers, consistent volunteers, maybe like once a week um, for four weeks, something like that. Um, other we're looking for that visitors, but uh, volunteer visitors we do get random visitors, but we're looking for volunteers too. So another question, I see PK, P and K, yeah. Yeah, um, I was wondering if you are open for any visitors by chance tomorrow. No, we're not up, yeah, we're not going up. Okay. Yeah. Okay, because my family's down in Chico and they'll be heading back to Reno tomorrow. Yeah, 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 so right now there's not much studying going on. Um, well, the weather's coming tomorrow, I guess the, the rain is today and it's gonna be raining uh, tomorrow morning too, but. Uh, Plus, I'm going to San Francisco for a while, so I'm on holiday. He's on um, holiday so. <laughs> I'm on holiday. We have a winter break, and uh, my wife and I both got the vaccines because we're teachers. So um, we're gonna. We haven't been out for a while, so we've got a, a place in San Francisco. So. Well, good for you, Ken, and thank you so much for coming tonight and 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 sharing this with us. Yeah, it was fun. There's another. Thank you. Station San Gabriel Mounts, yes. Wow. Thank you. Uh, yeah, thank you, Ken. That was awesome. Really enjoyed it. <laughs> oh, it was fun. It was fun. Good. <laughs> thank you very much. Yes. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. It was nice. <laughs>